Welcome and thanks for joining us for today's ASA webinar, Cooking and Nutrition for Older Adults. We will be getting started in just a few moments from now. Today's webinar is part of the Family Caregiver Support Series sponsored by Home Instead, Inc. The next presentation in this Family Caregiver Support Series is December 2nd, 2020. You can visit asaaging.org forward slash web, web seminars for more information. The slides for today's presentation are available under the tab marked Resources. Under the tab marked CE Application here contains information on how to obtain CE credit for today's webinar. You have 60 days to complete a continuing education application for today's webinar, and it may take up to 30 days from the date of your application in order for us to process and issue your CE credit. If you are not logged in directly to this webinar, that is, if you are watching as part of a group and did not log in using an individual confirmation URL, you will not be eligible for continuing education credit because we have no way of tracking your online attendance. If you'd like to receive continuing education credit, please be sure you log in using a confirmation URL you received after individually registering. If you have questions during the presentation, you can send those anytime using the questions box and we will save those for the last 15 minutes of today's program. And now we would like to welcome today's presenters. Lakeland Hogan is a gerontologist and caregiver advocate for Homestead Senior Care and a doctor doctoral candidate at the University of Nebraska Omaha studying social gerontology. She has a Master's of Arts in Social Gerontology and Master's in Business Administration from UNO. Lakeland has professional experience in the private and public sectors of senior care services. Shannon Muse has been a registered dietitian since 1996. She is a member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She has served in elected leadership positions for both the state and local professional organizations. Shannon has worked for hy V Inc. for over 14 years. She has diverse experience that includes weight management, diabetes, IBS, and the FOD MAP diet, food intolerance, menu planning, and eating disorders. She has received advanced training in wellness coaching, adult weight management, and the low FOD MAP diet for irritable bowel syndrome. She is a member of Dietitians for, in, in Integrative and Functional Medicine and works to stay aware of nutrition and diet trends and scientific research through continuing professional education and training. Now, we will start with Lakeland. Thank you so much, Jen. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to be talking about nutrition for the older adult population. And we know the importance of nutrition really cannot be understated or overstated, pardon me, uh, for the older adult population. But we know that some older adults uh, have issues with taking in proper nutrition. Maybe it's because they live alone or they have chronic conditions that inhibit them from, from cooking for themselves, uh, or they may just not know uh, what proper nutrition is uh, and how to get the most nutrients out of what they're, what they're eating. Um, so today, I'm excited to be joined by Shannon. She and I will be talking about uh, nutrition for older adults, cooking, uh, and we'll also be talking about the factors that influence uh, nutrition in the older adult population. Uh, so sometimes it's nice to put a face with a name, so there are our, our photos. Uh, but our objectives for today are listed out on the slide here. Um, first, we're going to start by talking about those causes and warning signs of poor nutrition. So we're going to be talking about identifying potential risks associated with eating alone. Uh, research has shown that uh, eating alone can impact your nutritional intake. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then Shane is going to go through our nutritional guidelines for working with older adults or for older adults and then recommend some tips and resources for us uh, on cooking, uh, particularly cooking for one, uh, but also cooking in general. So we know that there are factors that influence nutrition, and we can break these factors down into social and physical factors. So we take a look at the physical factors on the left-hand side of the screen. When you consider the aging process, older adults are more likely to develop chronic illnesses um, due to age and the internal systems 
that make up our body. They tend to slow and change as we age. And so various illnesses can, can occur that may require modification in what we can and can't eat. We may also see changes in energy levels on an older adult, and it might impact their metabolism. And when older adults have chronic conditions such as arthritis, they can have continual pain that may impact their ability to shop and prepare food. Shop for and prepare food. And chronic illnesses can also suppress the appetite uh, or the medications that are involved with chronic conditions could suppress the appetite, even though oftentimes these illnesses require more nutrients for the body. Another phys physical factor that we need to consider is chewing and swallowing. Some people fail to realize that dental health can play a really important role in nutrition. If an older patient is experiencing dental issues, such as poorly fit fitted dentures, cavities, or gum problems, it can impact their ability to chew and could limit the types of foods that they can take in. Uh, another thing to consider here is dry mouth. And this can sometimes be a common side effect of medication uh, in certain chronic con conditions such as Parkinson's disease. So again, chewing and swallowing could be a factor in uh, the nutritional intake of an older adult. And even if the in individual is taking the nutrition uh, and nutrients, they may have issues with absorption. The production of certain digestive enzymes and acids diminish as we age, which can make it harder for the body to break down things like protein and absorb key vitamins. And when the body can't absorb those crucial vitamins, it can impact uh, various systems in our body, such as the nervous system. And that could lead to unsteady gait, muscle weakness, uh, mental alertness, and poor circulation. So we need to make sure that the good things that we're taking in are actually being absorbed in the older adult population. And I already mentioned briefly medication. That can also impact nutrition. So it could suppress the appetite. It could alter the way food tastes. And it could have a side effect such as nausea or vomiting, which, of course, could impact a person's um, desire to eat. And if an older adult is taking more medications, uh, they're more at risk of non-compliance and adverse drug interactions, which could impact their appetite and nutrition. So it's really important to have medicines, uh, medications reconciled regularly to make sure uh, that an older adult is following a proper medication regimen. Older adults often uh, experience hospitalizations or illnesses due to a variety of reasons. A hospital stay could cause trauma and stress, which could lead to a loss of appetite or weakness. And after a hospital stay, an older adult might not be feeling up to cooking or grocery shopping. However, often it's during that recovery process that getting proper nutrition is so important. And in fact, uh, without proper nutrition, it could take longer for recovery in some cases or even lead to a rehospitalization. And as we get older, uh, we start to experience some sensory loss. I recently uh, did a presentation on sensory loss for this webinar series. Um, and there's two important senses that come into play when we are taking in nutrients. And I'm sure you can guess it's taste and smell. Um, and being able to taste our food and smell the delicious aroma is really part of the comfort and enjoyment of food. And so that may impact whether or not an older adult uh, is wanting to uh, engage in meal preparation and, and meal time. Now we also see lower activity levels in older adults, especially in those who've experienced limited mobility. And if there's a lack of mobility, uh, it could cause things like muscle loss and fat loss. Um, it could also impact uh, the appetite of an older adult. If an older adult's not up moving around, uh, they might not have that sensation of, of hunger because they might not be burning as many calories as they're, they're used, used to doing. And I know during this pandemic, many older adults might not have the chance to get out and about and move and exercise like they once did. So that might impact uh, their nutritional in, intake. Now when we look at the social factors, uh, while depression is not a normal part of aging, it could certainly impact nutrition. If an older adult is feeling low or depressed, uh, it could uh, prevent them from wanting to eat or they might not feel the desire to eat uh, or to take in proper nutrients. 
Another factor uh, to consider is income. Many older adults are on a fixed income and it could limit their food budget. So it could cause them to choose lower cost food items, which sometimes aren't always the healthiest option. And in some extreme cases, uh, their income is so limited that they may need to choose uh, you know, purchasing medication over purchasing their food or foregoing a medication so they can um, purchase food, which both scenarios are detrimental to the older adult's health. And then also companionship and socialization during mealtime is a social factor that is really important for older adults. We're going to be talking more about that in the coming slides. So now that we kind of have an overview of these factors in nutrition, it's important to also know the warning signs of poor nutrition. And this, this can be helpful for family caregivers to, to know about so that they can keep an eye out uh, in, their, in these warning signs um, if they're occurring in their loved, uh, with their loved ones. So the first would be a loss of appetite. If an older adult has always been a healthy eater but no longer eats quite like they used to, it might be a good uh, time to find out why that is. It could be caused by an underlying illness or problem uh, with ill-fitted dentures, those dental problems I mentioned earlier, or pain while chewing. Um, so if you're noticing a change, uh, it's important to kind of find out the reason why. Another warning sign could be changes in mood. Um, you know, I just talked about how depression uh, can be linked to poor nutrition. Uh, and, you know, if a person is feeling depressed or low, they might not want to eat as often. Or if a person seems out of it or is kind of exhibiting flighty or spacey behavior, it could be that they're not getting proper nutrition or it could be a sign of dehydration. Another warning sign could be a sudden fluctuation in weight. A weight change, either gaining or losing um, 10 pounds in, in a six month time frame could be a warning sign of poor nutrition. And sometimes it's hard for family members to really, if they're, if they're not uh, watching the individual get on the scale every day, it might be hard to kind of pick up on this, but family members can look for, you know, clothing choices. Have they, you know, started wearing all elastic pants because they've gained some weight or are they having to, you know, add another notch to the belt because they're losing weight. So again, weight gain is something to look out for. And then also skin tone. When an older adult's not eating properly, their skin could look um, ashy or dull. Um, and if a person is getting proper nutrition, their skin should be looking healthy and well hydrated. So that, that could be um, a warning sign of poor nutrition. Cognitive problems or changes in cognition could be something else to look out for. Dementia and other cognitive issues might cause a person to forget that they've eaten or could cause uh, Forget that they're eating, they've eaten and, and eat again so it could cause overeating, or they could uh, skip meals and not realize it. And then we also have to take into consideration medication, and we've talked a lot about this, uh, but if an older adult starts taking a new medication and you start to see changes in their appetite, that might be a sign that there's a uh, uh, that might be a sign that the medication is causing a, a symptom that's related to nutrition. So uh, we want to keep an eye out for that. And also those multiple medications. We want to make sure that those meds are being taken properly. A lot of times uh, they're supposed to be taken with or without food. So it's important for family members to help an older adult really understand the directions that go along with their medications because that could be contributing uh, to their nutritional intake. And then finally, lethargy. If a person is feeling tired or lethargic, it's tough to get motivated to make a meal or go to the grocery store. I'm guilty of that from time to time. After a long day of work, I might not feel so motivated. So if we're noticing that pattern in an older adult, uh, it might be a sign that we need, we need the family to, to get to the bottom of what's going on. Maybe it's that the older adult can't prepare meals for themselves anymore. Uh, they're too tired. So what is an approach the family can take to ensure the person is getting proper nutrition. And this kind of goes right into my next slide here. So if you suspect an issue, what, what do family members do? It's first important to really gain an understanding about what is going on in the older adult's life that could be contributing to or causing uh, these changes in their nutritional habits. And as we know, uh, sometimes an older adult might not be as receptive to conversations about this issue. They might uh, be embarrassed. 
that maybe they're no longer able to cook for themselves or uh, they might be embarrassed uh, that they're uh, having issues with their diet, might not want to admit that they need help. They might see that as um, a sign to their family that, you know, they're losing independence and that can be a really challenging um, situation to kind of navigate. So this could be uh, a sensitive conversation, but it's really important to talk with the older adult and talk through some solutions on how we could address the issues at hand. And you might be surprised uh, that many of these issues that an older adult is experiencing could be cleared up or could be managed by some simple dietary changes or with a trip to the dentist or a healthcare professional. And so consulting professionals when needed uh, is a good way to to address some of these dietary concerns, whether it is the dentist, uh, the general practitioner, or engaging with a nutritionist, a dietitian. And a lot of times, uh, nutritional professionals can help with things like meal planning, identifying foods that might help with poor nutrition, and navigating dietary restrictions. For example, if an older adult was recently diagnosed with diabetes, they might be overwhelmed and they might just not know where to start. So engaging with uh, a professional can really help um, understand those new dietary restrictions and move forward with a plan of action. I talked already about the social components of, of nutrition and mealtime, and at Home Instead, we recently did a study asking about loneliness and nutritional intake in older adults. And what we learned is that seniors who eat most of their meals alone were more than twice as likely to report that they feel lonely than those seniors that are eating meals with others. So mealtime can be a factor that contributes uh, to reducing the risk of loneliness if you're able to share meals with others. We also found that lonely seniors tend to skip 244 meals per year. That's about 22% of meals per year. And non-lonely seniors, they only skip 14% of meals. When we look at uh, the amount of fruits and veggies that seniors take in, uh, lonely seniors take in 157 fewer servings of fruits and, fruits and vegetables than non-lonely seniors. And then also it could lead to, loneliness could lead to more uh, of a poor diet overall. So we asked uh, those that we surveyed to give themselves a, a grade, A, B, C, D grade on their uh, view of their nutrition. And those who were lonely, they were more likely to rate their diet as a, kind of a C or lower, uh, which was higher than non-lonely seniors. And 29% of them, they ranked their health as fair or worse, uh, which was significantly higher than non-lonely seniors. So the takeaway from this study uh, really is that there are risks um, of being alone during uh, nutrition and meal time. And we know that um, loneliness, the risk of loneliness increases when an individual lives alone. And so in those individuals living alone, we're seeing that they're eating fewer regular meals, uh, they're using more convenience foods, and sometimes convenience foods can be, um, like prepackaged foods can be filled with extra salts and sugars and additives that might not be best for our overall health and, and wellness. And then often there's a reduced variety in the number of foods eaten, eaten if a person lives alone. I know I'm guilty of that. If I'm eating alone, I'm likely to just grab uh, the same old thing, uh, maybe make a, a, a salad and, and not really put a lot of thought into eating. But if I'm eating with others, a lot more thought goes into it. I tend to enjoy the meal more often. So you have to think about how that can impact an older adult. And there was an interesting study that was done. Uh, you know, if we can find uh, creative interventions for uh, reducing the risk of loneliness during mealtime, hopefully we can impact um, the, the nutritional in intake. And a study by McHugh and colleagues, uh, this, this study was published in the Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry, they looked at a volunteer program intervention. And this study, they used 100 uh, people over the age of 60, and these older participants were divided into two groups. So both groups, uh, they received a nutritional guidebook um, and that had some cooking tips and some recipes. Uh, and then one group 
also received an intervention where uh, they had volunteer visits. And these volunteers were sent into the home of the older adult participant one day a week to prepare a nutritious meal and eat that meal with the older adult. And the results showed that of the intervention group, the one with the volunteers, they had increased their food enjoyment, they had um, higher self-efficacy, and um, they also uh, enjoyed the experience. They really look forward to the volunteer visits. Uh, they had a higher nutritional status uh, and, and an overall just more enjoyment of mealtime. So what this study demonstrates is that introducing socialization at mealtime can really enhance the overall experience and in, increase the nutritional intake of the older adult. So uh, what can we do as, as family caregivers or as professionals in the field? We can encourage uh, older adults to create a social environment during mealtime. And I know we're in a pandemic, and, and for some older adults, uh, dining with others could put them at risk of social isolation. So you might need to get a little creative and introduce uh, some technology to FaceTime during meals, uh, but really that social component can be so important. And the socialization can kind of be carried out through the whole process, the shopping, the preparation and cooking, uh, and also going out for a meal can be a social, uh, can create a social component of mealtime. And also, when we think about it, socialization at mealtime can really help provide great cognitive stimulation. We're, we're engaging in conversation. We have to be attentive to what others are saying. We have to dig deep into our memory to maybe share a story, organize our thoughts. So really all of those uh, social components to mealtime can also stimulate our brain. And we know that sometimes um, an older adult might need additional supports in order to uh, take in the proper nutrition or to prepare properly. So some additional supports that are available, uh, one especially handy during the pandemic is uh, a grocery delivery service. So if an older adult's not able to get out to the grocery store, they could have groceries delivered, whether it's a family member ordering them and having them sent, um, or the older adult themselves could um, hop online and, and submit their order. Also, asking neighbors and friends uh, if they are willing to help with the shopping. And it could even be in exchange for a meal. Uh, maybe there's a grandson uh, where the, the older adult says, you know, if you can uh, get my groceries for me this week, I'll cook you a meal. We can cook a meal together. It's kind of a win-win situation. Uh, also, in-home care services, such as the ones we provide at home instead, uh, they can assist with meal preparation and grocery shopping, and they can provide that companionship at mealtime as well. There's also wonderful Meals on Wheels programs across the United States that can also help deliver nutritious meals to the older adult. And also senior centers and uh, congregate, congregate meal programs can also be a great alternative for some older adults that are able to get to those, uh, those centers those meal sites. And I know during the pandemic, a lot of those types of services have been suspended, uh, but some of these senior centers are getting creative. They're creating, uh, you know, meal kits or finding alternative ways to still provide meals to older adults. So these additional supports can really go a long way in ensuring that older adults are getting the proper nutrition. And now I'm going to pass it over to Shannon, who's going to go over what those nutritional guidelines are for the older adult population. So, Shannon, I'll turn it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Lakelyn. I'm so pleased to be here today to go over the nutrition guidelines for older adults. And these may seem familiar to you as they are common guidelines for people of all ages. And while many older adults take vitamin supplements, it does not mean that they can skip out on getting key nutrients from food sources. And some of the best nutrients come to us through fruits and vegetables. So fruits and vegetables are full of necessary vitamins and minerals and what we call phytonutrients. Each color provides unique nutrients. So encourage a variety of fruits and vegetables throughout the week and even throughout the day. Even though fresh is best, frozen is also a good option, and canned 
fruits and veggies are better than none at all. Make sure that canned fruits don't have the added sugars and try to look for canned veggies with limited salt content if the older adult needs to watch their sodium content. Um, one concern I see with, that's common with older adults is those on a blood thinner, an example would be Coumadin, may fear eating leafy greens because of their high vitamin K content. Vitamin K is what helps our blood clot when we need it to. Talk with the doctor about it. In most cases, if you eat a consistent amount each day, it won't affect the medication negatively. And protein intake is so important to avoid muscle loss and nutrition deficiencies. Aim for a variety of, of protein in the weekly menu plan. Tuna and salmon are especially good because they're high in omega-3 fatty acid, giving positive benefit towards heart health and brain health. Other good protein choices are lean beef, lean pork, chicken, and turkey. And try to include some plant sources of protein in the week as well, such as beans and lentils, edamame, or soybeans. And for those older adults recovering from illness or surgery, lean proteins are especially important and helpful um, for recovery. Okay, so you wanna choose whole grains over white refined grains. Excuse me as I take a sip of water. Um, so whole grains because they contain more fiber. And fiber helps with gut health and digestion. It's especially helpful to prevent constipation. And it's good to get 25 to 35 grams of fiber per day. Some nutrient-rich options for fiber are listed here on the screen. It's important to note that fluids are especially important with increased fiber intake. <coughs> Excuse me. Fluids play a key role in keeping digestion moving and all systems in the body working properly. Another thing to note here is serving size. One slice of bread is a serving and a half cup of cooked rice or pasta is a serving. Refer to the serving size in the packaged food label for guidance. Serving size needs depend on the older adult's size, activity level, and nutrition status. For example, it's normal or okay to have two to three servings of a grain at a meal and adjust the amount as needed for optimal weight and nutrition status. Dairy. Dairy is especially important for calcium, which helps keep bones solid and strong, especially in older adults. Other key nutrients that dairy provides are potassium and phosphorus. And fat is not something that has to be avoided, but it is important to educate older adults about the good fats versus the bad fats. And the fat from olive oil and canola oil, avocados or salmon, for example, can protect the body against heart, heart disease by controlling the bad cholesterol or LDL and raising the good cholesterol, which is HDL. An easy tip to tell older adults is to switch from solid fats like butter or margarine to oils like canola oil and olive oil when preparing foods. And then finally, the nutrition guideline to limit sweets and sugary drinks. And it, an idea might be to do to limit it to one serving every other day, and then to limit sodium if the adult is overweight or if fluid retention is present. And these are the guidelines um, that are for that. 2,200 milligrams a day for older adults and 1,500 milligrams a day for those with diabetes. So another healthy habit um, for, that's important for a healthy lifestyle includes physical activity. Participating in regular physical activity at least 30 minutes, three days per week is what's recommended to help maintain 
<clears throat> excuse me, muscle strength and muscle mass. Another tip to include here is to inform your healthcare provider or the doctor of any herbal supplements and extra vitamins that the older adult may be considering taking or taking, just to make sure it doesn't have any negative counteractions with the current medications that they're on or with their health conditions. And then the final guideline is to get enough fluids each day to still stay well hydrated and this is such an important topic that we have a, I have a whole next slide on it. So dehydration, we know, has been associated with many um, elderly health issues, including confusion, depression, or low energy, falling, um, and constipation. It's important to occur, encourage older adults not to wait until they're thirsty to drink. Um, and sometimes it's helpful to think of drinking water as a prescription. Drink eight ounces with the morning pills and then eight ounces with each meal and snack throughout the day. Keeping water close in a special bottle that's easy to use and carry can be helpful. And for those that find large glasses intimidating, Try using a small juice glass or a Dixie cup and refill frequently. I worked with a woman named Ethel, and several times a day she lined up her shot glasses full of water. She would joke about how many shots she took a day. So you can make hydration fun. Also, you can enhance water with a splash of fruit juice or cucumber slices or strawberry slices or fresh herbs. Um, even sparkling mineral water can be a nice substitution from time to time. Eating fruits and veggies that have very high water content can also help. Watermelon and cucumber are two examples. And unsweetened tea and coffee can contribute to the fluid intake, although that shouldn't be all that a person drinks. Some may think that caffeine can lead to de dehydration, which, you know, too much can, but we have since found that it does not necessarily dehydrate the body, even though the caffeine may cause more frequent urination. And a limit of two to three cups of unsweetened coffee or tea per day is recommended. Also, milk and 100% juice can contribute to the hydration goal. And speaking of goals, Dr. Connie Bales at Duke University Medical Center recommends older adults drink at least six glasses of water per day especially for those in warmer climates. So oftentimes, incontinence issues may prevent an older adult from drinking fluids. However, the dehydration risk can lead to other urinary issues, such as UTIs. So drinking fluids earlier in the day can help reduce frequent bathroom trips at night. And finally, it's important to avoid sweetened soft drinks um, or soda pop or sports drinks, they have too much sugar and empty calories. Choose unsweetened iced tea or flavored seltzer water instead for an occasional treat. So now we're going to talk about some grocery shopping tips. And here's tips that you can share with your older patients and their families. They may sound quite basic, but put yourself in the shoes of an older adult who may ne have never gone to the grocery store or had to shop in their lives. Maybe they've lost a loved one that did the grocery shopping for them. So a little bit of simple guidance can go a long way. So first, make a list. Maybe begin to sketch out a simple menu plan with them. If they can begin to figuring out what they want, want to eat, you know, for a week's time, the pre-planning can really help them reduce the time and money spent on food shopping. And you've probably heard this one before, but the tip is true. Don't shop hungry. If you do, you'll likely buy more or they will likely buy more and make some impulse uh, shopping decisions that they may regret later. Also, utilize um, store ads, clip coupons, Organize them at home. 
clearly shopping with coupons can save people a lot of money, especially for older adults on a limited income. Also, many grocery stores have a discount card or some type of grocery bonus card, and this can help uh, reap additional savings and take advantage of grocery store specials. They can also ask the grocery store if they have a special senior citizen discount. Also, encourage store brands or try store brands. They're often cheaper and often just as good as the name brand. And then try new foods so you don't get stuck, so they don't get stuck in a rut. Encourage um, new ethnic alternatives. One great suggestion is to try one new food each week. This has gotten easier in recent years. For example, many grocery stores now label the more unusual fruits and vegetables and suggest how they can be prepared and how they taste. So now that we've talked about nutrition guidelines and tips for making good food choices, I thought it might be helpful to do some food label comparisons on the next couple of slides. So crackers are a common snack food. So I chose two popular brands to compare. And I know it may be a little bit hard to see, but I have, I wrote down the numbers to go over with you. So first you wanna notice the serving size. So wheat thins, hint of salt on the left versus club crackers on the right. So wheat thins, 16 pieces as a serving size versus club crackers, four crackers as a serving size. So quite a difference here. So next, notice the total fat and saturated fat because saturated fat is the bad fat that we need to limit. So wheat thins has five grams of fat per 16 pieces per serving versus club crackers has three grams of fat per four crackers. So remember that serving size. So there's a reason that club crackers taste so buttery, right? Because there's about a gram of fat per cracker. Saturated fat is the same, so not a big deal, 0.5 grams per serving. So next, look at sodium, if your older adult is limiting sodium. Now these are the wheat thin tint of salt, so it's the lower sodium one, and it has 55 milligrams of sodium per serving, versus the club crackers has 125 milligrams per serving. So obvious advantage to the wheat thins there. So next, you might wanna check the total carbs or carbohydrates for diabetes or prediabetes or for someone that's overweight. Wheat thins has 22 grams of total carbohydrates with three grams of fiber versus club crackers has nine grams with less than one gram of fiber. And remember, we always want fiber. So considering the serving size and all of these things, the fat per serving size, the carb, the fiber, the sodium, wheat thins hint of salt is the obvious healthier choice. A popular dilemma that I help people with a lot is finding a healthier salad dressing that tastes good. And Bolt House dressings are one of my favorites. So we've got two salad dressings here. And again, we wanna check serving size and it's two tablespoons, which typically is the same for salad dressings across the category. Next, notice the calories, like 45 calories in the, in the Bolt House Farms on the left, 110 calories in the classic Caesar salad craft on the right. Total fats, three grams versus 12 grams. So quite a huge difference, three grams of fat in the Bolt House dressing versus 12 grams in the Caesar, Caesar salad dressing. So huge difference, which explains the calories too. Saturated fat, 0.5 grams, so half of a gram in the Bolt House on the left, three grams of saturated fat on the right with the Caesar salad. Sodium, 260 milligrams on the left with the Bolt House salad dressing per serving, and then 320 milligrams for the Caesar um, dressing on the right. So clearly the better choice or better salad dressing in this case is on the left, the Bolt House Farms um, dressing. And so it's a lower fat um, salad dressing and with a good taste. And I'm sure it's gonna vary a little bit across the country as to what you can find. 
But again, just to get you familiarized with uh, looking at labels and knowing what to look at. I think we have one more, okay. So let's compare some marinara sauce. There's such a huge variation that I see with marinara sauces. First, look at the serving size. And with this, it's typically half cup. Both of these are a half a cup serving size. Next, notice the calories. We have 90 calories on the left. With it, it's called Rayo's Homemade Marinara Sauce. And it's Bertoli on the right is 110 calories for a half cup. So 90 versus 110, not a huge difference. Next, let's look at sodium. 380 milligrams of sodium on the left for the Rayo's. 340 milligrams of sodium on the right. So the one on the left has just a tiny bit more, not a huge deal. Next, let's look at total carbohydrates. This is what is shocking to me. So total carbohydrates on the Rayo's on the left is four grams versus 14 grams in the Bertoli on the right. And if you look at sugar, which is part of total carbohydrates, the Rayo's has three grams versus Bertoli has 12. So a lot more sugar in the Bertoli brand, which is especially important if a person has diabetes or if they're watching their weight or if they have prediabetes. So this is also an example of a lower sugar item, the Rayo's, adding a bit more salt for flavor. So the trade-off is definitely worth it here, even though there's a little bit more sodium. The less the, the lesser sugar is definitely the desirable option. So switching gears a little bit, let's briefly review or kind of consider some pandemic considerations that we may have become familiar with this year. So consider limiting the number of trips to the store just to limit the exposure opportunities that the older adult may have. Also, shop at the off hours or at the designated times for those at risk. Many grocery stores have earlier, they'll open earlier for um, older adults or for adults at, um, at a, with a health risk. Also, utilize online shopping, delivery, or store pickup just to limit, again, limit exposure. Hire home care for nutrition support. Um, and occasionally, it's okay to enjoy takeout or delivery from a favorite restaurant on occasion. Okay, so let's go over a few cooking tips. And these are cooking tips that you can, you know, share with the older adult. Um, obviously, you want to work together with them to make it enjoyable. So first thing is consider making or creating a, a meal plan or a menu plan. Um, you can get elaborate if you want, or you can keep it super, super simple. The goal is to avoid eating the same meals multiple times per week. So you want to aim for variety, rotate all the meats that they like, you know, each day and look at the, the evening meals and the lunch meals. Same with the vegetables and the grains and the fruits, et cetera. So you can include snacks, you can include all the meals. And when you're doing that, think of ways that you can utilize leftovers too. So you could cook once, eat twice. For example, you make a pot roast on Monday night and on Wednesday night, you might make a, a beef stew with that leftover pot roast um, and leftover uh, roasted carrots and potatoes. Also, it's important to mix up meals. Consider um, switching it up every now and then. Consider uh, trying breakfast foods for dinner, or it's okay to have an egg salad sandwich or tuna sandwich in the morning for breakfast. Um, just think of ways, get creative with foods and, that are simple and that they enjoy um, and that it doesn't get too monotonous. Also, if they have, if they or a family member can help do some batch cooking. So for example, um, cook a large batch of chili, divide it into portions needed for an individual meal, whether it be one or two servings and freeze, freeze whatever you don't, you know, aren't gonna have at that time to use for meals later in the month because if they have chili every night for a whole week, they're gonna get pretty burnt out. 
and it's not much variety. Um, but be sure to date all the foods fresh and frozen that you're putting in the fridge or in the freezer so that you know, you know, when it's good to eat and when you, it's time to throw it out. And then lastly, don't be afraid to add a little butter or seasoning or fresh herbs and garlic and onions to, to vegetables to, to get them to taste good. Um, I think the most common uh, mistake that people make is not eating the vegetables, not even preparing them. So try to get in the habit of always having a vegetable at each meal, encourage, encouraging the older adult to. And don't be afraid to put seasoning on them. If they taste good, they'll eat them. If they don't, they won't. So they won't be excited about making them either. All right, so next I wanna talk just a little bit about food safety. And it's not the whole spectrum of food safety, but mainly um, food safety as it's related to food storage and utilizing leftovers. Cause I, I, I see an, um, room for error here and I get a lot of questions. So one, check the expiration dates on the foods that you're buying um, or the foods that they are using in their cupboards. Um, and if it's expired and it, if it's really expired, definitely toss it out, you know, um, and for sure, if it's a perishable item like uh, meats and uh, dairy, you know, it needs to be thrown out after, expir after it's expired. Next, uh, leftovers. Uh, you want to refrigerate them right after the meal. I think it's a common misconception to let it sit out on the countertop to cool. Um, it's not exactly safe, and that is the perfect environment for bacteria to grow. So you want to um, help them put it in a shallow container um, and refrigerate it right after the meal. Label the leftovers with a use-by date or or the date that you packaged it. Whatever you do, be consistent, but choose one of the two. Use within three days. So after three days, it should be tossed and reheat to 165 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the reheat temperature that's necessary to kill any bacteria that may have formed in it just naturally. Another common misconception with non-dairy beverages, you know how they become more popular, um, the last couple of years, for example, almond milk, coconut milk, they're in, um, sometimes they're in a shelf stable container when you buy them, um, which there's a date on the top or somewhere on the package of uh, how long it's stable on the shelf. And sometimes people think that that's how long it's stable in the fridge. So, and that's not true. So once it's opened, you should use it within seven days. After that, it should be tossed. Another thing to remember about non-dairy beverages, they need to be shaken well with every single use because they will separate. It doesn't have the protein content that dairy um, has so it, that, that keeps it held together. So shake well with every use. It must be refrigerated even though they may have bought it on the shelf. Um, once they open it, it needs to be refrigerated and then used within seven days. Another common uh, misconception that I see is deli meat. Once it's opened, it should be used within three to four days. Um, it's not good to keep it in the fridge until you know the date that's on the, the package. That is how long it's stable unopened on the grocery shelf so or in your fridge. But once it's opened, three to four days, otherwise harmful bacteria um, overtakes it and they are at risk for a foodborne illness. And the resources for this is the USDA.gov website. And, um, you know, go there if you have more questions or just want to check it out. Oops. Oh, that was it. Sorry, Lakeland. <laughs> All right. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Lakeland. And thank you so much for your attention and time. Thank you so much, Shannon, for going over all of those nutritional guidelines and food safety tips and cooking tips. I know I picked up a few new tips for myself. So these, these tips don't apply just to older adults, but apply to us all. So before we open it up for questions, I did just want to uh, go over just a few quick tips for making mealtime enjoyable, because uh, it's one thing to know about the nutritional guidelines, and, um, and it's another thing to shop for the groceries, but 
as we've learned, making mealtime enjoyable, enjoying it with others can really help increase nutritional intake in older adults. So some ways you can make this a little more fun, listen to music while cooking or eating. Um, you know, music brings back for a lot of people emotions and story sharing, and uh, so that can be a fun way to kind of enjoy mealtime. Also focusing on the foods and the flavors. Oftentimes, um, People can be in a hurry to eat, or we're so focused on getting the right nutrition, uh, but we sometimes fail to take time to really enjoy what we're eating. And then also, it can be helpful to set the table or use fine china. You know, there's a, a woman living with dementia uh, that we worked with who was really uninterested in eating, but she used to love to go out to fine dining restaurants or out just to eat. And so one of her caregivers brought out her fine china and set the table and lit some candles and put some background music on. And she started to engage in mealtime again. So you can make it fun. You can also find a new recipe in a magazine, or I love looking on Pinterest, uh, and you can try out that, that new recipe. You could also dust off old recipes uh, that are family favorites or traditional foods. I know, you know, going into the holidays, many of us, many of our families have those foods that really bring back good memories and are a comfort to us. So uh, that could be a fun way to engage the older adult in mealtime. You know, even if the individual can't make, let's say, a pie all by themselves anymore, what part of the meal preparation can they still engage in? Maybe they can help um, to stir, or maybe they can help roll out the dough, or just find ways that they can still engage. And even if it's talking to you while you're, you're making the meal, that can still be a way to contribute. You could also watch online cooking tutorials. I know during the pandemic, there's even been cooking classes virtually. So you could uh, encourage an older adult to maybe get with members of their family and engage in that. And then also the video call to share a meal with a loved one uh, if they're long distance. Uh, even just the good old-fashioned telephone uh, can be a great way to talk to someone while they're eating. Maybe put it on speakerphone so the older adult has someone to talk to while they eat their meal. Uh, so those are just some, some final tips on enjoying mealtime. And I know Shannon shared a great resource already on the USDA website, but we have a few more resources here. Um, we've talked a lot about seeking out a registered dietitian. Uh, this can be especially helpful for those with chronic conditions like diabetes, or maybe if the doctor has said, you need to reduce your sodium intake, you know, meeting with a dietitian can be very helpful. We have that USDA uh, website up there. Again, the National Institute on Aging also has some great tips on healthy eating. If you're looking for a Meals on Wheels program, you can go to the Meals on Wheels of America website. Uh, you can also uh, typically contact your local area agency on aging for that. Um, the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics has some great resources. Um, at Home Instead, we had created uh, a program a while back called Craving Companionship. So we have lots of great tips and uh, resources on there. Uh, there's foodsforseniors.com as well, and the Sunday Dinner Pledge. On that website, there's some meal planning resources that Shannon actually helped to create. So uh, you can download a pre, uh, kind of preset meal plan and a shopping list, and uh, that might make uh, going to the grocery store a little more manageable, especially if someone uh, has, doesn't have much experience doing that. And then if, uh, if in-home care is something that the individual would benefit from in terms of their nutritional support, their grocery shopping, you can always visit homeinstead.com. So uh, thank you all so much for joining us today. Um, this has been uh, great, uh, great information that Shannon has, has provided, and I hope that you all have a few new tools and tricks uh, for, or tools and resources uh, for the older adults that you work with. Maybe you even learned a little something that can help contribute to your own nutritional intake. Um, and we hope that uh, you'll join us again next month um, in our webinar series. We'll be talking about Alzheimer's and dementia care at the holidays time, uh, during the holidays. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jen. I know we have a couple questions that are coming in. We do. Um, our first one being, how helpful is a dietitian with helping older adults with nutrition? Shannon, would you mind speaking to that question? Have you, do you have a lot of experience? I know you have a lot of yes. experience in working with older adults. Yes, yes, for sure. Um, and I will say, um, 
it's very helpful to talk with a dietitian. Um, I, if you can talk to a dietitian that works in a supermarket, I think that would be um, maybe more helpful than a dietitian that's at a hospital, um, just because, you know, at a supermarket where you, you know, we're used to navigating the aisles and kind of used to taking those types of questions that people have about food choices, if that makes sense. Yeah, I think that's a great okay. suggestion. We have another question that says, why do care communities uh, serve juice? Uh, isn't it too high in sugar? I think that that's yeah. a good question. Shannon, do you have any thoughts on um, those juices yeah. that are high in sugar? Yeah, you know, um, Juice can be, yes, high in sugar, because 100% juice is sugar. Let me turn my volume down. I feel like I might be having, getting feedback. Um, but the risk of hydrate, dehydration is almost a bigger risk. And also, oftentimes an older adult has limited intake or they might have problems with limited intake. So getting in that even that nutrition and nutrients and calories from that little four ounce glass of juice um, can sometimes be important because maybe they're not eating much at their meal. So uh, when, when you're looking at older adults that are in a care facility, you really want to optimize every opportunity to get nutrition and get those valuable nutrients, whether it be through juice or milk and obviously the food that they're provided as well. So that's, I would say, the main reason as to why they're served juice. Just another opportunity to get, you know, valuable vitamin C or um, the other vitamins that fruit juices provide. Okay. Uh, this next question says, what should we tell people when they go shopping and forget the appropriately, appropriate label labeling guide? What is one thing we should look for? Oh, gosh. Um, it really depends on the person, you know, and what they need to, you know, be concerned about with their trish, nutrition. Um, uh, cause if, you know, they're diabetic, then they need to look at carbs. If they need to lose weight or gain weight, then they need to look at calories. So that's really, a, um, an individualized question. Um, you know, if they are overall healthy and, really not a huge concern in one area, then they may not need to look at the food label and just make overall good choices, if that makes sense, and limit, you know, think of the big picture items, like limit junk food and limit, um, you know, packaged sweets and and chips and all that. If they're overall healthy, um, then they don't need to be so concerned. Okay. Can you talk a little bit more about organic food and products? Is it better to pay more to get an organic food? Is it more nutritionish uh, and better for the senior diet? Yes, great question, and I get that a lot. Um, the studies, the most current studies still have found that nutritionally organic is really not much better than conventional fruits and vegetables and meats. You know, we're mainly talking about commodities when we look at talk about organic. Um, so it's not necessary to spend more money if budget is uh, restricted. And so it's more of a personal choice. Um, and I know a lot of uh, popular books and diets might say, oh, you've got to do organic so that you, you know, don't get this or that disease. and um, that is not based on science. It's what we call fear marketing. Um, so don't be afraid to buy conventional fruits and vegetables and overall healthy foods. It's more about making healthy choices in all the food categories, not about being organic. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, we have reached the end of our hour, so that would be our last question. Um, I would like to thank our presenters, Lakeland and Shannon, for being with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
If you would like to claim CEUs for today's webinar, you will be receiving a follow-up email by the end of the business day that will contain a link to the CEU application. That follow-up email will also contain a link to today's slides. Please note you have 60 days to claim CEUs for today's webinar, and please note it will take an additional 30 days from the date of your submission in order for us to process and issue your CEUs. Thank you so much for joining us today.